Okay, so well, I think we'll yeah, get started. It, right. It's always a case of um, people rushing to get here and then some people will probably have to leave before the end. So we will get started. Lots of thanks to Coma for coming in to do uh, a talk for you and thank to you for coming. And uh, I, I'll just leave it to you to, yeah. <laughs> to say who you are and what you've done and all of the rest of it. Okay, perfect. perfect. So, uh, yeah, good morning everyone. Uh, my name's Coma and... Um, it's a real pre pleasure to just to come back and be at the, the London School. I was here uh, two years ago doing the diploma in tropical medicine, um, and really it was very life changing. So it, it's uh, it's amazing to be back. Um, so I work as a general practitioner. That's my my day job. But I also do other bits and pieces, such as charity expedition, um, medic stuff. I've done a bit of humanitarian work, and and weirdly this week I've become a published illustrator, which <laughs> which I'll tell you a bit more about a bit later. Um, but we're quite a small group, so it'll be nice and relaxed and informal. If you want to eat your lunch, feel free. If you have any questions that come up, feel free to to stop and ask. It's not formal at all. But um, as we've got a small group, it would just be nice to know a bit about you guys. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to just introduce themselves, maybe what they're studying or what they're doing here at the London School. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing the Master of Public Health. Oh, fantastic. And I'm a doctor by background. Yeah. I'm Bobby, I'm also doing Master's in Public Health. Public Health. Cool. Um, I'm just happy, I'm doing Master in Epidemiology. Oh, fantastic. How about you guys? I'm doing Master of Public Health in India. Cool. I'm Sorum, I'm also doing Master of Public Health from India. Ah, good. Uh, my name is Jean, I, uh, I'm a doctor of side at Benvets in Beijing. Yeah, oh, great, fantastic. And I'm Sarah, I'm Kamal in 40 years' time, but without the ability to illustrate. <laughs> <laughs> and we did the diploma two years ago together, so it's really oh, nice that. I don't know if any of you came to Sarah's talk, because it was like a month ago. We have a recording, but not the slides. Just, <laughs> just the, um, just the words okay. on Moodle. Okay, great. Sure. Fantastic. Yeah, sure. I've got a friend at the back, Nicola, she's pediatric registrar. And I know this <laughs> so it's nice to have some support. And for okay, I'm in Oak, I'm doing it with public health. Public, okay, fantastic. All right, so it's very lovely to meet you all. So, let's get started. So, I was wondering where the best place to start would be. And um, really, it is here. So this is my class. Um, amazingly still in contact with a lot of these people through the medium of WhatsApp and, and Facebook. Um, an in incredibly inspiring group of people. And really, sp spending that three months doing the diploma and speaking to each and every one of these people has kind of shaped who I am and, and, and where I have gone. Um, And really, doing that diploma took me, so we're going to go straight into it, to working with MSF. That is what I wanted to do. Um, and there was a slow process to get there, but doing the diploma in tropical medicine was that, that jumping board. And I wanted to work with MSF because I really agreed with their ethos. They go where, where no one else goes, where there's crisis, where their most need is. And often they're the only humanitarian organisation out there. Um, and they're completely independent and neutral of any politics um, going on a, a, around. Um, and in regard to MSF, I don't know if anyone is interested in working with them or a few nods at the back. Uh, and I would wholeheartedly say yes do it if, if that's what you want to do. Um, so when I was here two years ago, uh, along with Sarah, we started off our um, application process. And it, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you apply online, um, you send in your CV, you write a personal statement, um, and it can take um, a little while for them to process that information. Um, you need to be committed. You need to have in your head around six to nine months of time where you can commit to going out 
uh, to the field. So it's, it's a big undertaking. And in fact, before I started doing the diploma in tropical medicine, I quit everything. I um, handed in my resignation at my GP practice and was, and was very committed to doing the diploma and, fingers crossed, applying to, to MSF. They give you feedback um, within a month um, and they ask you a few more questions and that's when they uh, then ask you to come in for interview and that's done here at the London office. Um, and there are offices all over the world, so whichever country you're based at and you want to apply, you, you would apply through that office. And it's a standardised interview, it's very straightforward and lasts an hour. Once you're accepted, what happens is you get put into a database uh, where your CV um, sits and it's a bit of a waiting game and that can vary from you know, a, a couple of weeks to, to a few months until they find a post where you're suitable to be, to be matched for. So they look at all your experience and what skills that you have. Um, I was quite lucky. I was placed within a couple of months. Um, they placed me in a, a couple of places, uh, in Ethiopia and uh, in India, but for reasons those didn't work out. And then finally I got placed um, to South Sudan, which I'll talk about. Uh, before you go, MSF do train you. They give you um, more information about uh, what you'll expect on mission, and that's called redeparture training. And that was done in Germany. So we spent a week with all different types of MSF staff, so logisticians, finance people, epidemiologists, um, uh, human resources, and obviously doctors, nurses, midwives, um, all, all of the people who need to make a uh, mission work. So uh, this is where I was posted. So South Sudan. Um, MSF have been in the country for, I think, over 30 years. Um, it's the newest country in the world. It gained independence in 2011. Um, but it descended into an ethnic and, and civil war around 2013. The government was very unstable and there was a tribal conflict between the president and the vice president who were of different tribes. So Nua and Dinka, they're two of the biggest tribes in South Sudan. Um, I was placed in a project called Bentu. Bentu is the name of a town. Um, in 2014, there was a massacre there, and uh, the local population fled. And at that time, there was a United Nations camp, a very small, insignificant camp. Um, but once that happened, and people fled, they naturally fled to a place of safety, which was this camp and it turned into a protection of civilian camp. And that camp grew and grew, and it, when I was there, there were 120,000 people. So these aren't refugees, these are South Sudanese people who are just displaced from their own homes, so internally displaced. It's a very contentious area, it's on the border, so as most border towns are. Um, and there's a lot of natural resources and, and oil fields, so again, making it a very unstable area. This was my first view of South Sudan. I really did not know what to expect. Um, and in fact, South Sudan wasn't even on my radar until MSF told me about it. Um, the top picture here uh, on the right is Juba Airport. So Juba, if we look at the map here, is the capital city just in the south. And um, it, it's built up. Um, the airport was pretty basic and it was actually running out of tents when I was there. It was the most bizarre, reason, uh, bizarre feeling, kind of checking in well, in, in a tent, <laughs> and watching your bag being carried off, hoping it would get on the aeroplane. But the, the city peters out very quickly once you're in the air, and then all the way from the south, 400 kilometres up to the north, to Bentu, this is all what I saw, just green, beautiful land, and swamp land, just going on and on. I didn't see any infrastructure, any roads or buildings. Um, I didn't see any cultivation or, or, or farmland. 
um, it's just great expanses. It was rainy season when I started my mission, that was July 2016, so that's why it's so green, so wet. So, travelling across, this was my very first glimpse of what would be my home for six months. This is the protection of civilian camp, this is the United Nations camp. Um, and this is where the 120,000 people stayed. It's all been blocked off into, um, um, all the shelters are blocked off in sectors and roads. It's all very organized. And um, the, the, the walls around are mud walls, so they're quite high, they're quite difficult to climb through. Hi, come in, come in, make yourself comfortable. You arrive at a good time. So I'm just talking about um, Doctors Without Borders. And this is um, my mission uh, in South Sudan. And this is the camp where I was working at. Hello, come in. So just a closer look. So um, as we traveled across that square, um, this red square here is the Doctors Without Borders camp. Um, and it's, it's tiny, that kind of, a uh, postage stamp in the corner is a closer look. So all these green tents are the hospital. So each, each of these is a ward. So we had a paediatric ward, a TB ward, um, uh, infant feeding ward. Um, and that hospital here, all, all tents would house 160 people. Um, more in the rainy season, people would sleep on the floor and, and under beds. Here, these two tents, these are our uh, store tents, so all the lo logistics. Um, so we had a lot of medicines and equipment in there. And these tents here is where we lived. So um, we slept on mattresses on the floor. So it's a, it's a very small camp. And as I said, the perimeters are mud walls. These grey dots here signify uh, watchtowers and turrets. It was an odd place to, to work in because they were manned by the United Nations soldiers. Uh, they were weaponized. Uh, they, they were watching and protecting. There was only one way in and out of the camp, so it was very secure. And in fact, our camp, so this little compound, was also surrounded by earth walls, they're called HESCO walls, and they're cages filled with earth and stone, and they are bulletproof. Um, so we had that as extra protection. It was felt it was too unsafe for our hospital to be here where the civilians lived uh, in case there was any unrest, hence this buffer zone. So people who were unwell and sick would have to make this walk um, across the buffer zone to see us. Um, in the hospital. Um, along here, you might not appreciate, these are big, cute ditches. They're filled with water. In rainy season, the whole place floods. There's nowhere for the water to go. The earth there is called black cotton co uh, soil, and it doesn't absorb water, so that water just sits. And the year before I joined uh, this project, the whole place got flooded, and there was a lot of um, sickness because of that and a lot of drownings so changes were being made um, to the camp every year um, all of these tents are other organizations this is the world food program with their stores and there were three different United Nations soldiers there I think Uganda India and Mongolia were represented Uh, inside the camp, um, as much as it looked very organised from above, it, it was a little chaotic. It, it's overcrowded. Um, families were provided with shelters um, and they were just tarpaulin with stick and it, and it was just a room. Um, so a whole family would stay there, sleep there, eat there, cook there. Um, sanitation was a big problem. 
there were long drop toilets, um, which were looked after by other care agencies. But again, standards maybe not as good as, as you would have hoped. And there's a lot of fear uh, using long drop toilets, especially with the children. They would not like to use them. There was that fear that they would fall in or they just weren't that nice, you know, in regard to smells and insects. So there was a lot of open defecation uh, in the camp. Um, and there's a lot of children. I think a lot of children. Um, it was a very young population. And um, they were quite wild. There were some schools, but again, not enough for, for that population. So they were often left to their own devices. So that was a, that's a little taster of, of my mission in South Sudan. Um, so obviously here we're talking about careers and kind of talking a little bit about my story and my journey. And along my, my way, I, I met some incredible people. And I just wanted to introduce some of them to you. This is Sabine. Uh, she is a midwife from Germany. And in fact, she was at the end of her, her career in Germany, although you wouldn't know it to look at her. She, <laughs> she, um, she had um, had her family, her boys had grown up, and she wanted to, to, to give back. And so at the end of her career, she decided to work with MSF. And she had first-hand experience particularly of women's health, of what was happening there in the camp. And she commented on, on how you know, the women would have seven or eight children. Um, contraception was a big problem. It, it just was a big taboo. It wasn't really talked about. Um, and often male people in the family wouldn't allow it. Um, and even just basics, like women having menstrual cycles, you know, there weren't any pads or washing facilities. and. Um, life, life, life was very difficult there for the women. This is Johanna. Uh, she's a nurse from Sweden. Uh, she started with MSF very early on in her nursing career. She, she graduated, I think she worked a couple of years before deciding to go out in the field. Um, and here she is um, holding up some little booties that she had knitted for the newborn babies. Um, who often needed to be kept extra warm. Um, and again, she, she noticed you know, the importance of, of women there, really, because mother to, to seven, eight children, and, and if a woman dies, what happens to those children? Um, so the, we really felt the work that we were doing was, was important because it wasn't just about one life. It was about that you know, knock-on effect to all the other lives connected to that one person. And then lastly, uh, we've got Bhavna. She's a surgeon from India. And again, an incredible woman. And maybe not your, your typical surgeon being female and then working in, in conflict zones. Um, her mission was very short. It was six weeks. Um, and all of her missions, wherever she goes, are, are short as a surgeon because you're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you have to deal with whatever comes in through the door. Um, and there were a lot of challenges there. I mean, here she talks about a case that we all shared um, of a woman who came in with an acute abdomen. We didn't know what was wrong, but she needed surgery. Um, but we weren't allowed to do that surgery because we didn't have permission. So her aunt, a, a blood relative, had said we could do it, but that wasn't good enough. It had to come from a male member of the family, and uh, the male member of the family said no. And it was a very difficult situation to be in because we were in a, uh, in a position where we could potentially help. Um, but you have to respect the cultural norms in that area, whether you agree with them or not. And you know, we had a lot of conversations with the family, uh, with the MSF team, uh, with the local elders, but it was something that we just could not do. Because if she did die on the operating theater, uh, MSF's name would be tarred and that relationship with the community would be spoilt and we would potentially jeopardize that whole mission. Um, so, it, you know, it, it was difficult. 
So three kind of very exceptional women there. But before I even got as far as doing the diploma here and applying to MSF, when I was studying to be a general practitioner, um, I met some people who were going to do a course in expedition medicine. So WMT, Wilderness Medicine Training, it's a large British company and they provide expedition courses. And um, having listened to them, I was quite inspired and thought, oh, that would be fun, why not? I've got a week of leave to use. So I, I, I did it and that was a five day course uh, learning about uh, field skills uh, in remote areas as well as a bit of um, outdoor medicine and you learnt about working in the mountains, in the desert, in the jungle. And then having done that course, I, again I met some really interesting people and, and I started thinking, you know, what else can I do? You know, as a GP, as, as, as a doctor, there, there are other things I could do and that led me on to working with Rally International I don't know if anyone's heard of Rally. Got a few few nods. It's a British-based charity, and they help facilitate volunteering <coughs> around the world for 18 to 25-year-olds. Um, but they need people to facilitate those uh, placements, so doctors and and project managers. So as a doctor, you have a dual role as a project manager, so facilitating these. Uh, projects that they have out there which are often uh, working in communities to get uh, water to a village for example or taking part in uh, research so you're helping find out about biodiversity in a, in a, in a certain area um, so you're doing that um, as well as your medic role so education everyone about expedition life and looking after the day-to-day -day things that might crop up So I was placed in Borneo um, for three months. So <laughs> this was my home for three months. And it probably, I think it, it was the hardest thing that I have done. Living in a jungle is no easy feat at all. Um, not only are you looking after yourself and surviving, <laughs> you're also having to look after other people and I suppose that's one of my first tasters of what being an expedition medic was all about and you realize that expedition medicine is more than just the cuts and scrapes and things that can happen to you um, there is it's very broad you know I've written here that it was exhausting and morale sapping imagine be living in a forest you can't see the sky you can't see the sun it's always wet you're never dry, you're never clean, and it gets you down and people start behaving differently. People maybe go to bed earlier, maybe they skip dinner, and these are things that you need to kind of look out for in your team and bring them back and make sure that they are eating regularly, that they are sleeping, that they are spending time with the team and having their own time as well, um, so that your project is successful. And again, having done the diploma, I look back on it and things I learnt on the diplo diploma about water and sanitation and where you would dig your long drop and all of that kind of made, made sense. So we've got all those little bits and pieces, but really I put this slide in just to remind myself <laughs> that I am a general practitioner. <laughs> this is what I do day to day. Um, I've worked in Greenwich, which is just down the road, in a large practice. I was one of, of a few doctors, and we covered um, a case list of 14,000 patients. And that's the job I quit to come and, and work here and do the diploma in tropical medicine. Now, I work in a very different place. I work in Essex uh, in a single-handed practice, and we cover around 3,000, 3,500 patients. But really, I suppose general practice has given me the, the strength and the stamina to do these expeditions because it's hard being a GP. 
Um, you know, I get over 50 patient contacts a day face to face, and that's not including telephone calls and then all the uh, prescriptions and clinic letters and um, admissions that you have to organise in the day. They're long, long days. So um, that has really put me in good stead to, to be an expedition medic. Uh, back to some sunshine. So after I quit my job to do the diploma in tropical medicine, I had some time on my hands. And again, having done rally, it was people that I had met along the way who gave me the inspiration and, and ideas to work with Blue Ventures. I don't know if anyone's heard of Blue Ventures. Yeah, perfect. So Blue Ventures is a marine charity organization. Uh, they work in the southwest coast of Madagascar. And um, this bay here is called Anne Davidoak. It is absolute paradise. It is what it is uh, in that photo. Uh, it's home to 2,000 people, and they're all fishermen. They're called Vizu, the Vizu tribe. And it's all kind of hand to mouth in regard to their, their life there on the beach and going out fishing. And what Blue Ventures does is work with them to find a sustainable way to fish and a sustainable way to live. So they require volunteers to come out and they teach you how to dive. And if you can dive, then they teach you to go up to the next level. So I became a rescue diver while out here. And they teach you how to identify fish and coral. Weirdly, I can identify 250 different types of tropical fish. <laughs> and um, um, you go out on dives and, and you do this data collecting. And they use that data to find out if their strategies are working or, or not. Um, this woman here is uh, collecting octopus. So there's a lot of education that goes into to the local population about when, when should you fish, so only collecting the big fish, or when, when should you collect octopus, what season should you do that, so they're able to breed and make the next generation of fish that you can then fish later on. So, my role there was one as a volunteer. Um, you can't get away on expeditions just being a, a medic. You have to get stuck in and involved with everything else that's going on. Um, but as a medic, it was my responsibility for the day-to-day -day health of the, the scientists out there and the volunteers, and also just ensuring everything's in place. Do we have our medical evacuation plan organized? You know, are the radios working? Is there oxygen sorted? Um, are the boats equipped that we go out diving with, with what's needed? Um, and it was doing rally that gave me a bit of experience about diving, which then kind of slowly grew and grew and grew to doing something like this. Again, you probably have realized that there was no grand plan. Uh, a lot of these things were just opportunities that came along from talking to people and finding out what have you done, what, what, what have you enjoyed, um, which have led me to do these different things. The majority of, of stuff I do outside of GP is doing charity trek medicine. Um, I don't know, does anyone, has anyone done a charity trek or or know about charity treks. We've got a few hands there. So charity treks are slightly different to going on a holiday and doing a hike or doing a walk. Um, you've got that physical and you've got that mental challenge, like, like you would do with any walk if you go on holiday. But what makes these different is, is the people that do them. Um, often something has happened, uh, some personal adversity or tragedy, uh, to make you want to, to do a track, to push you out of your comfort zone, um, raise money for, for a chosen charity. Um, I had, on my very first trek I did, 2011, we had a chap who sustained 50% burns. He um, was on a night out and was drunk, and he fell onto a railway line, and it was electrified. He survived that and spent a year in hospital. He lost his ears, most of his fingers, most of his toes, but he got to a point in his life where he was ready to, 
to to face up to a, a challenge and give back to the charity that looked after him. Often there's a, it can be part of a bereavement and grieving process. Um, I had a lady uh, on my last trek uh, last month who lost her father-in-law to uh, heart disease and she wanted to raise money with her husband uh, for that charity, the British Heart Foundation. Um, so she was gearing up to that. During that time, she lost her husband as well, unexpectedly, to the same heart disease. So utter devastation. She lost her father-in-law, she lost her husband. This is a woman in her 60s who had never done anything like this before. And um, she decided to climb Kilimanjaro for them, for the charity. And often you find people also do it to, to build self-esteem and, and to find courage. Because if you can climb a mountain, if you can trek 100 kilometers in the desert, then you can achieve anything, really, if you, if you put your heart and soul into it. And often, again, they're not doing it for themselves, but they're doing it for loved ones. I had a lady on my last Kilimanjaro trek from Canada who lost her husband to cancer. And before he had passed away, he had told her that she should go and do something crazy. Do go on an adventure, do something you have never done before. And, um, and she did that for him. So there is so much more to, to, to being a Trek medic um, than necessarily meets the eye. And that's why I've been doing it for so long, um, because of the people that you support and you meet along the way and sharing their dreams and their goals is pretty addictive. So, Charity Trek Medic. I've written here, it's not a holiday. <laughs> Often a lot of people think it is. And, and in some ways it's, 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 an, it's enjoyable, it is an experience, but you are contracted, you are there um, as the medic and you have responsibility for the people that you trek with and the support staff the guides and the porters around you, because often you are it. There is no one else when you're up in a mountain or in the middle of a, a desert. And not only are you doing that trek, you need to be fit and have the mental willpower and stamina to do it. You have to look after these other people. Often you're on your own um, as the medic, depending on the group size. Um, mm. But they can vary. I've done treks, you know, with seven people in them, so very small. 20, 30 is usually average. Um, this year I've done a few groups of 100, and actually tomorrow I fly out to Amman with a group of 70, um, and there'll be another medic there, so I won't be on my own. Uh, general practice is, is a brilliant platform because it does give you that general knowledge. Um, and you do need some knowledge about altitude medicine and working in in remote environments and having done that wilderness medicine course, working with Blue Ventures, working with Rally, it's, without realising it, I had slowly acquired that knowledge and that skill to be able to, to be a, a Trek medic. So I just thought I'd include this slide. Um, these stars just represent some of the places I've been lucky enough to work and it's very varied you get altitude treks so avenue of volcanoes cotopaxi in ecuador uh up in india in um stock Kangri was the highest trek i did at 6100 meters uh, obviously we've got kilimanjaro everest base camp in nepal and you get other treks like um the great wall of china or uh, desert treks in the sahara so it's, it's very varied I thought I'd just spend a little time talking about Kilimanjaro because um, I've done lots of different treks, but I think most people have heard of Kilimanjaro and it's a very popular trek. It's the highest mountain in Africa and uh, it is one of the seven summits. And I think this is what makes it so attractive to people to do. It's one of those things you can tick off your list. Um, and it's very accessible. Um, you don't need any climbing equipment, 
no crampons, no ice axes, just you and a pair of walking sticks. That's it. Um, so it attracts a lot of people uh, with varying degrees of, of fitness. And its highest peak is 5,895 metres. So it's pretty high. There are various routes. Um, the ones that I have done is the Lamosho here in the west, which comes around to the south and up, and Rongai, so the northeast, which comes round and up. There's Kilimanjaro just there on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. These treks typically take seven days. Trek life is pretty basic, but when you compare it to things like Borneo, uh, and, and Davidoke in Madagascar, this is pretty luxurious. You get a bowl of washi-washi, so some water morning and evening. Um, you have a chemical toilet that porters carry up for you. Um, we have a mess tent where we have our meals together. So again, expedition in life always boils down to basics. You know, are you washing your hands? Are you eating enough? Are you getting enough sleep? We have a medical kit that we take up with us. Um, again, the porters are the most incredible people you will eat, ever meet. Um, and they carry all your quit. And they also carry the medical kit. So that's there. And this chap carried like, my medical kit all the way up and all the way down. We also take oxygen with us on, on this Kilimanjaro trek. But I have to say, I've never used it. And I'd never hoped to, really. A lot of things on expedition are, are preventable. So the medical kit is pretty basic. It's just a lot of pills and a lot of bandages. Um, but we have things to deal with, so wounds and suture closing, a burns kit, antibiotics, painkillers. Uh, diarrhea vomiting is very common, so we've got meds to sort that out. Um, of course, in case of anaphylaxis and allergy, um, again, cardiac kit, you know, we've got aspirin and things like that, a diabetes kit, and um, the altitude kit, which includes uh, medication like Diamox, uh, which is often used to help with altitude sickness. Um, as a medic, you're lucky. In some respects, you get a tent to yourself. So it's a little bit lonely and a bit cold, <laughs> but that gives you the space um, to sort out your medical kit. And if you need, you can have private one-to-one -one conversations um, and you can look after patients there if you need to. But often you, you're in other people's tents do, doing that. Summit night on Kilimanjaro. So you do a day of trekking and you have a sleep. And at midnight, you get up and uh, you start your 1,000 meter ascent. Um, and that can take anywhere between seven to, to nine hours. Uh, it's slow, it's slow, it's cold and it's dark and you're already tired, you've already trekked six days. Um, and it's the hardest day of trekking, most people say. And some of my clients have described it as hell on earth and, and uh, you, know, she, you know, asked us why we didn't tell them what it was really like. But there's always two stories to Kilimanjaro. There's that story you tell, tell your friends and then there's the story you tell amongst each other. Because if you told people the truth, no one would climb Kilimanjaro. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a popular trek and a lot of people do it, but it, it shouldn't be taken lightly. And there is a reason why medics come on these treks. Altitude sickness is, is pretty common, but you, there are more serious things that could happen, like the pulmonary edema and the cerebral edema. None of my direct clients have had that, thankfully, although I have been called to uh, help people in other groups who didn't have uh, medics on their trek. I remember one night being called, Doctari, Doctari, can you come? And I was still in my pyjamas, and <laughs> walking in the middle of the night with a head torch to another camp and it was a Japanese group and um, there was a chap who was having breathing difficulties 
at which point I'd woken up and realised, oh, this is something real, and went back and got my stethoscope and my pulse oximeter reader and went back. And he was very unwell. Uh, his chest was bubbly, he was blue, he, he wasn't breathing so well. So we treated him with a kit that we had from, from ours, told him to get oxygen and, and take him down. Um, I don't know what happened to him, but I imagine he did all right. Because really, the treatment for most things on, on Kili is to get down, uh, get back to, to some oxygen. So, kind of the reason, again, I just wanted to bring it back to people. Like, why, do we, why do we do the things we do? Why are we doing doctoring and public health and you know, all these things? And um, I wanted to share the story about Abby. So I climbed with Abby in 2015. She's a very quiet girl. She didn't really talk very much. Um, and she became quite unwell with altitude sickness. And we wanted to send her down. Like, she was having sickness, diarrhea. Uh, she wasn't doing too great. But she, she really did not want to go down. You know, she'd signed up to Kilimanjaro. She'd spent a year preparing for this moment. She'd raised money. You know, all her friends, all her family, they knew she was out there climbing this mountain. I, you know, she's not going to come down easily. But she showed enough fight and enough perseverance that, you know, we negotiated with the guides and the porter, uh, the leader <coughs> and herself to, okay, let's try another day. Let's try another day. And remarkably, she was able to do another day and another day. And this photo was taken on summit night, just below Gilman's Point. And remarkably, she made it up to Gilman's Point, which is up on the summit. Uh, you know, and this is a girl that I wanted to send down on day two um, because she wasn't well. And even though she didn't reach the, the summit, Uhuru, you know, she reached her own summit. And she wrote me a letter. I was going to bring it today with me, but I, I left it on the kitchen table. So two years later, three years later, she's still remembering this moment. People might say, oh, it's just charity trekking. It's just expedition medicine. But it's more than that. She accomplished something that she was told that she would never be able to accomplish. She'd spent a year as an inpatient uh, with anorexia. And she was told by doctors and nurses that she wouldn't be well enough or she wouldn't be strong enough. But she proved to them, and more importantly, proved to herself that she could achieve that. And again, all of these people, so all the different treks from Sahara, Everest Base Camp, Stock Kangri, Sumatra, these are all charity trekkers with all their own personal story, which I've been able to join just for a short amount of time and, and help them on their way. So, back to South Sudan. We're coming to the end now. Um, so I just, again, wanted to share some patient stories. Uh, this is Lucky. Lucky by name, Lucky by nature. He is an 18-month-old baby, or well, he was two years ago. And uh, his mum had come in and he was wrapped up in blankets. And I actually thought he was a newborn baby. He was so malnourished and, and skinny, and he only weighed four kilograms. And this is an 18 month old who should be running around. He should weigh more than double that. So he became a, a patient of ours, and he ended up staying in the hospital for 45 days. We started him on a feeding program. We started him on oxygen, and Slowly, slowly, he began to improve. He had a MUAC, so a mid-upper arm circumference, that was just two, f two of my fingers. He was very undernourished. Uh, we discovered he had HIV and, and TB, um, but despite all that, we were able to get him more than double of his weight, four kilograms when he arrived. He was 10 kilograms when he left. Um, so like a happy, almost healthy, healthy baby. And that was a, a, a very special story because he should have really died that day he came into the hospital. 
um, all of us really thought it was too late. But MSF was there, and his mum brought him, and we did what we could, and, and that's what we achieved. So he was a very lucky baby indeed. I wanted to share with you Naya Yang's story. So again, still in South Sudan, I was working. Jeremiah, here in the red, was one of the HIV TB counsellors. And he came to me and he was like, Dr. Kamal, Dr. Kamal, um, come and see. I was so busy that day, I really didn't give him any attention. And then again, he was like, Dr. Kamal. And I lifted my head and um, I saw this chap. Um, and he was standing tall and happy. And I recognised him. I was like, oh, hello, how are you doing? His wife had been a patient uh, on, our, on our TB ward. And I asked him, how is your wife doing? And he started to laugh. And that's the man there in the, wi in the white. And I was like, why are you laughing at me? And then next to him, he showed me. And he said, this is my wife. And I just did not recognise her at all. This woman had come to us on a stretcher. She had TB of the spine. Um, again, similar to Lucky, I just, I thought it was too late. She, she couldn't walk, she was in pain every day. The ward rounds we did were so distressing because I felt like nothing was improving, nothing was helping. But we got her started on TB medication, discharged her back into the community. And this is a few months, this is at the end of my mission, so this is four months kind of later after meeting her. And she's up walking with a stick. She's able to be a wife. She's able to be a mother. And again, that happened because MSF was there. And really going back to what Nurse Johanna was talking about, if you, you are able to save that life of that one woman, she's able to save the lives of those children, her husband, and you know, all those extended family. And that photo was taken just then when we had that conversation because I was just so blown away by the whole situation. <laughs> While I was out there, I started to draw because it was just an in incredible time. Uh, I didn't sleep very well out in the camp. It was hot, it was stressful, um, and I, I taught myself to draw slowly, slowly, and I was drawing portraits of our patients and uh, the staff that we worked uh, with, because each and every one of them, totally inspiring people, and I've included a few of them here. And again, something I didn't expect to learn or to or to do. And from that, because I ended up drawing so much, I didn't sleep at all really <laughs> for six months, um, I was encouraged by the staff to present these pictures and weirdly in an internally displaced people camp we had a portrait expedition, uh, exp um, exhibition and uh, these are the, the patients uh, that we treated. So, life after MSF. Um, I was talking to Penny earlier about what it was like coming home. And in, in all honesty, it was difficult. Um, and I hadn't realized that it would be. Um, having spent six months of my life living, working, breathing with all those uh, people out there to then one day wake up and your mission is over and then you have to leave. I left my patients, I left my colleagues, um, knowing that I would never see them again. Um, and, and that was difficult. And then coming back home, which is home, but a, a, a very you know, different world, a Western world, and, and then going back into general practice, where you do get people who do moan and complain that things aren't good enough. And when you come from a camp where, where there is absolutely nothing that was hard to bear. Um, but, you know, you, 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 you get back into your rhythm uh, and you seek the support from your friends and your family. And, and MSF never leave you, uh, they're <coughs> their family for life. And since that, I've done a lot of public speaking uh, at donor events, at universities. 
I've done fundraising at musical festivals. So they, uh, even though if you're not doing a mission, that you, you're still part of it. And you give back in different ways, by public speaking, by encouraging people to maybe donate money or maybe think of doing a career themselves uh, with MSF. So just to round up, I was talking to my friend Ratika. Just, she's a student here doing, a, um, doing oh, yeah. public health. <laughs> Um, we were just talking about the things I've done, and, and she said, you know, you know you're, you've done a quite a, various things, you've had a varied career, and I suppose that's because I've been quite open to opportunity, and I've listened to other people and what they've done and, and, and what they've thought. And most recently, um, going back to what I said at the very start about becoming an illustrator, uh, Ratika came up with the idea of writing a book on gender equality for children, uh, a baby book with purpose. Um, so this has come out in print this week, amazingly. Um, so, <laughs> so, if I'm going, <laughs> so if I'm being in South Sudan and then learning to draw out there to now doing this, the world is a very strange, strange place. So. Um, We've made this. Her family have visited a school in Kenya, and we're hoping all of their profits go to that. So um, it's, yeah, it's really just to sum up that girls can do anything, be anything, but you know, whoever you are, girls, boys, it's just taking the opportunity and not letting anyone say, no, you can't do something. Because I was that awkward, shy person at med school and a long time after, and it wasn't until I met, you know, people from here, from Rally, from Blue Ventures, people who said, yes, you can, you can do these things. Um, so to end, I want to say thank you. And there's a newer phrase that says, mountains do not meet, people do. And I, I really like that, that, that phrase, because it is all about people, whatever it is you do. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I don't suppose there are any questions. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was wondering if you could just describe um, it's like a typical day if there was one. MSF. Yeah. So uh, they were very structured, I suppose, uh, a day uh, working in Bentu in South Sudan. Um, you would wake up um, and you would have breakfast together. And then as the, the medic, I would start my ward rounds. So I would do uh, inpatient ward round uh, for a general medical ward round. And then I would do a TB ward round. Um, and at the same time, if there were any admissions coming in through A&E uh, that needed to be assessed, I would dash off and, and go and do that. Um, we'd have a, like a, a siesta at lunch because it was hot, 45 degrees, there was no air con, no fans, and we were working in those tents, um, which was even hotter. For the first two weeks, I did a malaria test on myself every day because I thought I had malaria, and I, I was just hot. It was just <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have a fever. Um, and then in the afternoon, um, I would do a TB and HIV clinic, so we had outpatients. Um, so that would be a typical day, and that would be interspersed with security meetings, medical meetings, mortality meetings. We tried to do some education for the local staff as well. Um, and we would work six days and then have one day off. Um, and that day would be sleeping, basically, and washing your clothes by hand. <laughs> So that was that was the day, and then you would do on calls. So every other night, um, I was on call with the other doctor, um, covering what, stuff in the hospital. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. So so MSF, um, you work with national staff, so they hire local people if they have. Um, the skills. Um, so out there, um, 
we, each of those tents would have 20 people, so 10 beds on either side. Um, and I would do the ward round with um, two nurses from South, South Sudanese nurses. And just like you do a ward round here, really, you'd go around um, and if there were medications that need to be issued, the nurses would take that and they would organise that. Um, and, you know, we had notes that we wrote in, so it, it, was, it was very similar. Um, the system out there, we didn't have any, like, HCAs, so healthcare assistance, so it would be left to a family member who would also stay with that patient to help clean them, wash them, help feed them, um, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's um, it, yeah, that's no, it's a good. I've got no language skills, <laughs> so don't let that put you off working with MSF because I know there's a big push that you have to speak French. Um, I have no French. Um, South Sudan is English speaking, um, but there was a local tribal language, so the South Sudanese staff would help translate along the way. But you become quite good at l picking up language uh, language skills. Like I could tell someone to cough and sit up and you know all the all the medical things that you need on a ward round in in the local language so yeah they provide translators <laughs> what's the role of epidemiologists yeah so uh, a really imp important one we had a guy from lebanon called rami and he he came out and spent time uh data collecting um <laughs> it's a subject I don't really know very much about, but it's a big part, it's a huge part of MSF, because MSF do a lot of research uh, and, and, and data collecting, and they're used in all the projects. So you're not just based in an office out of the country, you're often in the field as well. Yeah. <laughs> so public health interventions are invited within the hospital care, uh, or is it like you have a separate public health? It's a preventive healthcare we need to be So we had, for I mean, for our project directly, we had um, a lady from Canada who did a lot of health promotion, um, and she would do a lot of, I mean, we stayed within the hospital, but she would go out into the community with local staff and give presentations on TB and HIV and how it's spread and how you can prevent it and what the treatments are all about. So... It's it's part of projects, and I don't know, Sarah, when you were in Chad, did you have any health promotion and that type of thing? Yes, there, was, there were designated people who then went out into the community yeah. um, and did specific talks, and they, they trained up some local people as well to do the same thing. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a huge, huge part of it. And every, every project is very different in regard to what they do. This project was, was huge, really, because I was one of three, there's two paediatricians and myself as the adult doctor. And we had, I think, three or four um, expat nurses. Um, but usually the, the projects are much smaller um, with one of each, each staff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I felt it was it was amazing grounding, you know, reading lecture notes of tropical medicine and then seeing it firsthand. Like literally, it was <laughs> it was amazing, um, and it, it, it put you in good stead. And I'm so glad I did do it. Um, you also could get a lot of contacts. You know, I was there on WhatsApp speaking to to people from the diploma, people from the school, MSF to give you people in their headquarters in Amsterdam. They've got HIV and TB specialists that you can email and, and speak to and contact. So, you know, you're, you're never on your own. And, uh, you know, sometimes if it does take a little while, you do get that information and, and you do get that help. I'm going to interrupt there as well. MSF have masses and masses of um, guides. Um, so, so, you know, there's one on snake bites, there's one on HIV, there's one on TB, there's, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, very well-referenced, um, very up-to-date, they, they update you very frequently and they're, they're very evidence-based and easy to follow. 
Mm. So, so that you're, you're not alone, you've got your book. <laughs> and I think that's kind of, again, point. you don't have to be super duper clever or intelligent or do loads of research. Like, I'm not that person. <laughs> you know, I was a GP in Essex. Um, and it's about knowing your limits and, you know, we know where to look for information and, and there are people to ask, so, yeah. I think you were going to ask a question. Um, yeah, it's quite a like, shallow question, really. In terms of your expedition stuff, because I've also done the WMT course, and I'm just terrified of, like, the physical... Yeah. Because do you, how, like, how much physical training do you yeah. have to do with so, the Again, I, I'm not anything special, and it's weird that I'm standing here talking to you now, because... In 2011, when I did my first charity trek, you know, superficially, I, I did it because I wanted that experience. I had no idea that it would impact me in, in the way it has for me to do trek after trek. Um, and what it boils down to, I, it's, it's just walking, and everyone can walk. And I know that might sound a bit strange, but I'm, I don't go to the gym, I don't, I don't do anything special. A lot of it is up, up here. And once you've done one trek, um, I felt that I can do that, so I can, why can't I do any, anything else? And that's why I've, I've been able to continue. So really, it's, just, it's walking. Walking, walking, walking. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I tell my, the clients as well, because you'll get people different shapes and sizes, and people who have never even camped or, or slept in a, in a tent before. So you get a whole host of people. But I, as I say, it's often it's, it's up here. So your body can do more than, than you would think. <laughs> Anything else? Just about the transition period. Are there the, I think it's um, well, the last cohort of doctors that are leaving cross over? Yeah. Do you have the opportunity to learn? Oh, yeah. OK, good question. So, yeah, so you finish your mission and then you're replaced by someone else. Um, for me, uh, my, my departure was delayed by a week because of a security risk in Juba. So I was literally with my bags packed, just waiting, waiting, waiting to be told that I could fly out. So as a result, I didn't get a handover. I met my, 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 the person I was taking over um, on the tarmac uh, at Nairobi, uh, <laughs> airport. It was not ideal. He, uh, he looked so tired and s <laughs> so dirty. And then there I was, like, fresh-faced with my brand new MSF t-shirt. <laughs> and I was looking at the person that I was going to be <laughs> in six months' time. So um, we had a quick chat, but obviously not a handover. And weirdly, we, we've stayed massively in touch through email, through WhatsApp. So even though he left the field, he was a we were able to share a lot. Um, so there was a, a, a far away handover. But when I left, um, my counterpart uh, from Canada, she came uh, a week and a half before I left. And so she was practically doing the job before I left. So it, it really, it just varies. You have to be so flexible when it comes to, to expedition, MSF life. But you are supported. You are always supported. You're never alone. <laughs> Anything else? No? Oh, okay, good. Well, yeah, no, really, thank you. Thank you for listening. And I hope, yeah, it, it's been interesting for you. Thank you okay. so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.